Hello and welcome back to the channel, it's Mark from Powersonic and Apprentice One to One. As you'll see behind me here, we've got another solar PV array we're putting together on a customer's property. We're going to go through this install at the start, now it's finished, and show you exactly what we've fitted. And then we're going to break it down and show you how we did it. Just to stay at the start of this video, if you are a consumer looking for a solar PV installation or battery storage, our contact details will be in the description alongside this video, so please do reach out and get in touch. If you haven't already and you're enjoying these videos, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you don't like it. And as always, get involved in the comments. But without further ado, let's turn around and have a look at what we've actually got on this particular system here, and we'll move along from there. So as you can see up on the east side of the array, and apologies, this is um, me getting mixed up often with the arrays through this. I think I've been getting east and west mixed up a lot. But you can see here we've got a good 400 mil at each edge. This tower was already dropped down here. We've not done that. You can see the stains on it. It's in the same position. I don't know why it's like that, but it's bedded in on the side. So original construction, we got pictures before we started. Point of note, if you are doing your solar PV and you notice something like that, make sure you document and evidence it before you begin. We've got our panels nice and flat. We've got all the clamps in the right place. You can see looking down the roof there, nice and straight. We've got the Van der Volk bird guard in. I know you can leave it on an angle flat to the, to the tile and there's an argument if that keeps the birds out better than, than like this. We cut it to the profile of the roof um try and stop the birds getting in there but equally try and make it look as nice as possible see it's been raining this morning loads of um water on the panels helping us to generate electricity and not we need to clean these down a bit you see the little fingerprints so we're going to do that we're going to clean all the gutters out as well we're just hoping it dries off a bit this afternoon because it's still a bit soggy and that's a bit minging in there we'd prefer to do it dry we'll clean the scaffold down for the scaffolders as well make life as easy as possible for them and yeah, that's the east roof. So that power comes off the solar array into these DC isolators. Now they're there if you need to make an isolation on the array for maintenance or the inverter needs replacing. It's a safe point for you to turn the system off in terms of generation. That then comes off and up these DC cables into the inverter itself. And that's where the magic happens. So that DC energy is converted into usable AC energy. It's then sent out through the AC cabling out through the AC isolator and back into the wider system for it to be used in the house and charge up your batteries if you were using AC coupled batteries as we are here. Now, if this was a DC coupled battery system, there would be some DC cables coming off the inverter and straight down into a DC coupled battery bank where the excess energy from solar generation could be stored up or you could charge off peak from the grid to then discharge as and when you need. And there's this secondary EPS cable here, which is an emergency power supply circuit and that can feed into a local consumer unit to power your essential lighting, small power sockets, Wi-Fi router and heating and such. In this case, we've made use of it to power the garage circuits because our inverter and the solar PV is remote from the house itself. So scaffolders have been and done as a solid, great little system here. This is a triple garage, 24 panels, guardrails each end. And we got a couple of hours on this. I think we've just done two to our three, actually. So we've got two of these rows done. These rails are going to go vertically up the roof pitch and the panels are going landscape. So we've got 12 on each row. It's 24 hooks, an hour and a half, me, Matthew and Nathan. Uh, Monday morning when we're back, we'll get this top row done, get it railed and then repeat on the other side. And I would have said quite easily by the end of Monday, we'll have all of this railed and hooked and ready for panels all been well we need to clean off all this moss we're going to give it a right good wash and clean down we're putting the rails on first it's quite slippy up there so there's no point crashing around with a sweeping brush and hose pipe trying to get this cleaned down until we've got something to hold on to um, at the side of our ladders so that was the decision we made but it is very mossy the other side's actually worse if i come around this end just to show you um, the outward aspect so you can see this is an east-west split. It's going to be 12 panels on each side. Lovely open aspect to the back. Loads of sunshine. Trees over there for a little bit of shading. So these are all going to be optimised. Um, Got needs cleaning out. But yeah, nice job to work on this one. We'll get loads more content on it for the YouTube video next week. I'll show you some of the inverters. It's got an all-in-one on it as well. And we'll have a delve into that in just a sec. And show you how some of these hooks go in. Just to quickly show you at the bottom of them, see so we're all ground out nicely around. Hooks sat off the tile below and um, not just touching on the one above. Obviously, we're trying to avoid the wind deflection on these from pushing down and then crushing and snapping this tile underneath. And equally, we don't want these lifted up so the weather and insects can get in later on as well. And as you'll see, looking down the roof, they're all nicely sat down 
Right, it's as if we'd never been there aside from the pointy hooks. You can see Matthew and Nathan just imagine, uh, inspecting their handiwork um, and having a look up the roof ridge. So yeah, we'll be back Monday and we'll carry on with it then. Okay, so we're just setting out the uh, ray on the roof with the rails now. And again, with the Van der Valk mounting system, if I show you here, there's the um, bolt, it has a little line on it. You need to make sure that line is vertical because that indicates the head of the bolt inside the rail is twisted round the right way and you're actually fastening it up correctly. So we've set these rails onto the roof, leaving enough excess each end for the end clamps to go on. That's one of the reasons we're putting these string lines down, so we know we're bringing enough rail on the top and bottom um, to get those end clamps on and equally to visualise our position on the roof that we are central in the um, vertical pane on here. And then as we install the rails moving along, we can bring them up to the string line and get them roughly level at the first setting out. We will go over with a hard edge to make sure that they are level all the way along. This is quite a long run of six panels in landscape. So this string line might not be quite under enough tension and it could drop just a little bit. Although it looks like Matty's got it quite tight to be fair to him. Um, but yeah, we'll go over that with a hard edge at the end just to make sure they are straight. And then we've got the torque driver down here. So I'll show you that being used in a bit so we can go over all of the fixings and make sure they're torqued down as we did with the brackets under the tile as well. And yeah, we're just going to move along now, get some of these rails fitted. I'll show you that when we've got moved along in the stage uh, a sec. But you can see here the head on the back. That's what I mean by twisting it on that line to vertical. It just basically ensures that this is spun the right way around in the rail to lock it into position. We'll get on dropping some rails on the roof and I'll get a bit more footage in just a minute. So the way we bring our DC cables out is using some oval tube. You'll see here it's gone between the, the laps in the felt. So we've put that through to the inside of the garage and we can now pop those DC cables in, which are double insulated, through this oval tube. We'll grind out the bottom edge of the tile just like we've done for the hooks. So that sits flat back down. And I think that gives a really good weather seal and the cables are protected as they're running through and past all of the, the tiles. You can get the deck tight kits. I've shown them before on the videos when we've used them. We grind a little hole out of the tile you fit the flashing kit over it, the other tiles to each side then kind of bed over it to give a weather tight seal with some rubber bungs in the top for you to push your cables through. But this for us just seems to be a better way of doing it. You're leaving the roof structure largely as it is. The weatherproofing is taken care of in the same way it always has been and you're not putting an extra component into the system on the roof surface. So it's just the way we tackle it. Let me know what you think in the comments, if there's a better or other option. And um, we're all ears. You can see Matthew's just poking those DC cables through. So that'll hold onto this tube for him. And we should see them exit out the end. There they are. That'll give them a pull now. So you can see we've brought our cables out onto the roof now. We'll seal the end of that up so no insects are going to get in it. It's nicely cut out. It's flush to the um, roof face. There's no water or penetration that's going to let any insects or... Um, liquid vegetation into the internals. Matty's brought the MC4 kit up, this is from LK. So you get this as a kit with everything you need, all the dismantling, tightening, cutting, stripping, terminating tools. We'll show you that in a minute, making these off. Um, we've got our strings up now. One thing we do do is we're obviously putting LK connectors on the end of these strings. Now optimizers could have a different type of connector on. We are using optimizers here, as we've said before. So we will also be taking off the connector on the optimizer to connect into the one we're putting here. So they mate up the same. I believe there is some interconnectability between different brands now. They have brought documentation out to say they're happy for that to be done. But the cop and regs are quite clear on your MC4s being from the same brand that made together. So that's the approach we take. Um, and yeah, we'll go on doing that now. I'll show you a bit of the footage of an MC4 being made off. Okay, so we're just making off the MC4 connectors now, and this is with the LK kit, as I said. Um, so you need to cut it nice and straight, first and foremost. Then if you take the gland itself, the whole body, you can sometimes just poke the cable through just enough. You want to undo it all the way, take the top part away, and then gently push this back body down. With it being 6mm, it is a little bit stiffer. It's easier to try and keep it together in one part when you come to push it forward later. It goes on easier. So we can just leave those out of the way for now. We're then going to strip off about 8 to 10mm of outer insulation on here. And again, we don't want to take any of the inner strands so we've been really careful with the croppers you can use the stripping tool that comes in the kit but i just prefer to use the croppers i'm then going to pop our pin in the six mil hole in the back of the crimping tool just to the back of the body of it so get our pin in the back there and just hold it 
so it's rested in place. Slot the cables through. Again, it might be a little bit tight because it's been six mil. Give it a squeeze so it's crimped all the way. And then you want to check that that's on nice and tight. Everything's seated inside, which it is. And we then need the top part. Make sure it's clean and dry. Put that through. Push till you hear a click. That's now locked in. And then I'm going to take the back body back up. And this is a bit tricky with gloves. We'll give it a go. Gently try and push the bung up. So it all sits inside, that's giving you weather seal, that's the really important part, you don't want any of that splayed or getting trapped. And then do it up loosely by hand as far as you can, and use your tightening tools. Again, these come in the kit from LK, so everything you need's all in there. Give it a little twist until you hear a click, and then you know that's nice and tight, all done up, ready for connecting into an optimizer. So we've got our DC cables brought out over there. Now one's going into the top row, one's going to go in the bottom row um, and then return back to the inverter. We're going to get a couple of panels on the roof now and square them up at that end to get them fixed down and then we'll start working across out and away to the other side. We're going to leave the last two off for now because it's a route over the ridge to get to the other side. We're going to have to drive some panels around in the vans next door. They've given us permission to drive up there. Driveway, it's just easier than trying to lump panels over the top with just the two of us and there's no real access down the back of the scaffold. With us being on the neighbour's side, it'll take 10 minutes, so we'll do that tomorrow. Um, yeah, let's we'll see how far we can get this afternoon with these panels and chuck a few down on the roof. So you can see we're all mounted now. Matt is just going along putting his marks on to chop the rail down so we can put the end caps on. We've got a couple down at this end already. Um, these are all fixed down again with the end clamps top and bottom, mid clamps in the middle. We've got these in the zones for the Jinkos for the wind loading. I think it's called PA based on the design calcs. It's different on every system you're installing. You need to make sure you get that. These, if you go in on the long side, is A divided by five, plus or minus 5%. Um, so I think that is 330-ish to 370-ish. You can mount these on the corner. You can mount them on the short side. You can mount them with a combination of either or. Um, but it does affect that PA rating. So you need to make sure whatever you're choosing for the wind zone you're in, that it still satisfies that and that the array is going to stay nicely on the roof after you've finished, basically. So make sure you're checking that off. But that's all done now. We've got to go along and trim the top as well. Obviously clean all the fingerprints down. We've left these two ones off at the end so we can run over the roof to the other side. We are going to take the panels around in the van rather than try and chuck them up the side of the scaffold on the neighbor's fence. Um, yeah, it's just not easy access. So we've got access still to take tools and equipment over the top as and when we need them, but we can take the panels around in the van. Um, to the other side. We'll do that tomorrow, I think. We'll get this side all sorted out with the end clamps for the rest of today. We'll possibly put a bit of bear guard in. Um, and yeah, we'll do the other side tomorrow and we can start looking at some commissioning and getting this turned on. So while Matthew's up on the roof fitting those end claps, he's making a bit of a row doing it, but we'll leave him to it. He's busy grafting away, which is the important thing. That's what we do. That's what all of the main thrust of our content about is marketing the business um, and growing our uh, pipeline of work for Matty and Nathan and myself to go and knock out the park in the installation side of things. Um, the content is secondary to all of that. Uh, you can see here we've got our DC isolators. So the strings off the roof, as I showed you up on the top, we've got our oval tube poking through the overlap felt there and the DC cabling. We have got a little warning notice up there about that. We're gonna pop some more hither and thither when we get to that stage. We've still got the strings dangling down over there to take onto the other roof. Need to move some of this stuff hopefully not the canoe, to get that out there. Um, and yeah, just it's always nice to get this set up first. So when you start laying your panels on, obviously they become live in the daylight. Um, and having all of this connected and wired away removes any prospect of live working with all of this. And we have our DC isolators. So those strings come straight down into these. They can then be um, turned off at that point and you can safely work in and around the inverter without encountering any danger. Now there is some guidance, I think it's been produced by Ricks and MCS and a few other people um, that have said to where possible, not install DC isolators. Now for me, that, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If we're intending to comply with EWI 1989 and BS 7671, which is a fixed wiring standard, we need those points of isolation in the fixed wiring. And this smacks a lot of when we changed from plastic consumer units because they were setting on fire and used metal ones rather than solve the problem let's put a sticking plaster over it it all boils down to skills and who's making off the terminations in these bits of equipment 
And we really need to look at that. It's all about um, having electricians who are capable, competent, qualified and confident to do this work. Um, it's an admission and a half to say that you're not capable of wiring up a DC isolator without it setting on fire. The issues in and around them are still minuscule percentage. Um, and while safety should always be a priority on any system, that also includes safety of people coming along to carry out maintenance in the future. If you look at these MC4 connects on the bottom, they are just plastic. This DC isolator is in very close proximity to it. Now, if you imagine five years down the line, if this is installed outside, open to the elements, UV damage, wind, rain, all the rest of it, these can become brittle. If you're poking at these, trying to free them with a, a tool or such, you're going to operate this DC isolator and you knock into those and the brittle and the brick. Those two things that need to go wrong at the same time are not an unrealistic probability. I think we need to be very careful at the direction of travel that I've noticed industry seems to want to take. Um, and it's counter to what lots of what I would call um, solar installers who are wanting to do really good work for their customers rather than some of the big nationals who want the de-skilling to take place so they can use any old cheap labour to wire these things in a plug and play style onto solar roofs and trainers who can put bucket loads of people through the 500 to 1000 pound cost to say they're competent to fit solar panels. That is the tide we're pushing against and I will not stop my message that DC isolators are an absolutely vital part of a DC cabling system in the fixed wiring so that when this inverter's on the floor these cables are flapping in the breeze there's no live voltages in and around a person a few years down the line. Um, and equally, the maintenance aspect of solar installations is absolutely critical. It's, it's written through that document. Everyone's kind of clung on to that little thing. DC isolation shouldn't be used where possible, but they're ignoring all of the maintenance side of things that that's also recommending. We need to be looking at being more rigid in our um, ongoing maintenance of PV systems. So going out to customers annually, biannually, to check connections, make sure they're tight, make sure there's no damage to inverters, because these are a big failure point in the PV system as well. Are we gonna start doing away with these? You know, it's, it's crazy. It's like um, gas explodes in people's house sometimes. Shall we let them fit boilers, but turn the gas off? Madness. These isolators are a safe way for electricians to go to work and they should not be emitted. And we will always install them on our solar PV systems. And the messaging coming out of industry, I would caution everybody to think of the future. Five, 10 years into the distant time, and when a user might be messing around and operating these, do you want to be part of that clan who is calling for the emission of these where people can ensure a safe system of wear in the same way they can with an AC isolator and the same way they could have done with a plastic consumer unit if it was properly maintained and installed by skilled and competent people and the manufacturers robbing all of the fire retardant material out of that. That's my hill. I'm going to die on it. I will never, ever be responsible for a solar system that does not include DC isolators. And these are from MCG, decent quality brand, really nicely terminated. I made a little video, I'll try and crop and cut it in with this, where we made off those connections, stranded DC cable, barrel on the end, talked up, arranged 12-month um, commission uh, check after all the commissioning, and, and again, one of the best tools in the armory is this, not my brain, it's TIS and the solar PV check and ISO test equipment. When we've installed all of this, we put it through the fault checking, we do the commissioning, we ensure that our generation is correct. We're doing our IR testing, our continuity testing, everything gets done. And again, apologies about Matthew up there doing some actual work. Um, but yeah, that is so important. If you in If you install in a dedicated way, you take your time, you're methodical, you test and commission your system correctly, and then you arrange ongoing maintenance with your customer, these, these present no more danger than any other component within the system. And they're there for the future to enable safe working practice for someone else. Simple as that, isn't it? Let's move on with the video. So we're just cleaning down the roof, as you can see here. Um, this was really bad, this side. Matthew's just giving it a last little brush off um, over there. We're gonna let it dry then. We'll give it another brush over once it's dried out before we wash it down, um, before we mount the panels, just to give it the best chance of staying clean under all those panels. But you can see the gutter's absolutely full 
of moss. It's really bad. And we've already got half a bag loaded up in the rubble sack as well. The other side's not quite as bad as I've shown you, but still we're gonna have to give that one a brush and a wash down as well. Um, because obviously planting this under the panels, it'd probably die off in truth, but it can get stuck under there. Birds might decide they're gonna make a home under it, even though we're using bird guard. They always find a way. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna clean it all out, get it as nice as we can, and we'll get some hooks laid down on this side in just a few minutes. So I apologize about the audio on this. I am just using my phone, but it's really difficult to bring the camera up and get footage when I don't have a camera crew like some of the proper YouTubers. So I'm just doing this as safely and as easily as I can. Um, but I appreciate it may not sound the best, so just bear with me. If it's really bad, I'll voice it over. You can see we give it a good brush off just to loosen and agitate all the big bits of moss. So we've got this much, much better than it was. We've given this other side a bit of a more aggressive brush down as well. We wanted to get all the loose stuff out. So we've got all of it out the gutters, bagged up. Um, and now we're just gonna let it dry a bit while we put the first row hooks on maybe. And we'll give it another brush off at that stage. It's a bit sticky and soggy. So the moss is just kind of brushing itself into these tiles. So we're just gonna let it dry off and try and get the worst of it out the way while we can. And we'll then give it a wash down, just give it a hose off. Um, and try and get it as clean as possible before we start laying our panels. If the customer wants, we'll put a, a coat of patio magic or something on it as well. I don't see the purpose, to be honest. It's going to end up under the array with bird guard and what's left will just naturally die off and fall away. So what we didn't want is for that to happen under the panels and for it then to clog into the bird guard. It stops the ventilation, it doesn't look the best and birds and mice will find a way. If they see a load of debris to make a home in, you're just encouraging them. So we wanted to clean it out as best we can. We've marked on the tiles at this side that need to come up. Obviously, we've done the other side, as you've seen, so we know where all the timbers are in this roof now. So we've just got our bottom row marked. We're going to pop these tiles out, get some hooks in. Um, we've got our flexi tub here, impact driver screws, some repair tape if it's needed, and the hooks ready to go in. These are the twist hooks from Van der Volk, so they're for our landscape panels. Um, the repair tape, we've not damaged any of the felt. Uh, this building, I think it's 20 years old, I'm guessing. You can see the house over there. It's um, not old. It's in a village on a street with lots of old houses but there was a house there that was knocked down and they built two bigger nicer ones it's the short story um and yeah it's not especially old 20 years i think it's just been well weathered as you can see um, but there was some squirrels in that corner we think or mice and they've made a little nest between the felt and the tiles um, and they've damaged the felt in that corner so we've popped some repair tape on that it's only a small little hole we uh, will let the homeowner know, and if they want to make a more permanent repair, they can do. Obviously, the underside's accessible. It's a garage you'll have seen us working in there. And I think, if I look down the edge of this one, the actual damage we found on the other side was under kind of that tile there. So it's still going to be accessible after the array is mounted anyway. The rest of the other side was fine. Not even counted anything. Um, the repair tape really is if you do have an accident or a slip, um, you can use this stuff to repair the felt. Obviously, you need to discuss that with your customer if they're happy with that as a permanent repair under a roof array. But while you're working, obviously you can't do anything about that damage at the time. It's good to have the tape in your bag so you can make good the roof while a proper repair is actioned. Otherwise, you're just leaving it open to the elements while a builder or a roofer can get involved. So we always have a little set of that on our kit just in case. So you've got the big softy on the ladders. Um, they're rolled up there just to help us get up and down the roof. Matthew's fine walking on this, he's not bothered. As you can see, we've got scaffold all the way around, both edges. It's 33, 34 degree pitch, I think. So there's not a big um, steep slope to be climbing up. He's quite comfortable and less easy on roofs, as you all know, who watch these videos regularly. So I've been using the big softy and the steps just to get up and down um, onto the platform. I'm okay once I'm up to the top to slide down the other side, um, but it's just getting going. A bit slippy in my old age. But yeah, we'll get these ground out now. We'll get a bit of footage of that. As I say, we've marked these all the way along. There's 12 hooks going in. Need to pop a couple of tiles out here and there because the, the timbers, as you'll see, they kind of fall here. And our, sorry, our hook lives here, but I think the timbers are over this side here, just on there. So we need to take both tiles up. It's under the join, um, which is a bit awkward, but no great dramas. So I'll show you how we do a bit of that um, and get these onto the roof. Okay, so when you're setting out on a roof, um, you obviously want your array, if you can, to be positioned centrally 
in both the very vertical and horizontal pane. It doesn't always pan out like that if the timbers aren't quite right or you've got some shading. You can see this, this building here, that's to the north, so it's not going to cause us an issue with our array. But there could be some trees or something and you want to just try and shift it up to get the best generation rather than look the most symmetrical on the roof. In this case, we are going to put it centrally in the both vertical and horizontal pane. Um, and obviously you need the size of your panels to do that. The software will do it to a degree with the aerial shots um, and you can measure these out as well and make a little plan. But until you get on the roof, it's really difficult to get properly organized. Um, our array is gonna finish about 500 in from each edge. So we've got a good space at the edge. And then from the top, I think we're 400 top and bottom. So it's a bit tight top and bottom, but we're just sticking inside the MCS. Uh, regulations so we can get that done but yeah you just mark your corners of your array so you need to know the spacing between your panels and that's your mid clamps they'll have a set distance and then you need the length of the panels you can mark your corners of the array each side see where you sat with that and then the hooks usually need to be within three or four hundred mil of the end of the array depending on the mounting system you're using so you need to find a timber there that works with that and then the spacings between your hooks will vary on the mounting system and the wind loading calculations and such. We're going for, um, these are vertical rails, so we're going for two tiles between one of the hooks and then three tiles between the other. We just wanted three hooks per rail basically with the two panels in landscape um, and it was either two tile distance at the top or three at the bottom. So you just try and make it make sense basically. Get your mid hook as close to the middle as you can and then your end hooks within the set distance of the edge of the array. Uh, and then we're repeating that all the way along. So with these in vertical, quite straightforward, um, we're just picking, I think it's every other timber. There's a 1200 gap and then we're 300-ish off each end of the panel. I think the panels are 1760, 1720 long. So it kind of works out. You will shift as you move along, you will shift closer towards the edge with the 1200 spacings and trying to keep the distance each end um, you'll see it as we lay them down and we've just tried to edge that out as best we can starting um, as far away as we can at one end and then at the other end we'll be towards the limits uh, closer to the edge it'll make sense when you see it laid down matthew's just opened up the roof here so i can show you what we're faced with on this side oh the felt's different to the other side that's weird um but yeah so we'd mark these you need to find your timber so that timber's sat there our hook's gonna go into here so we screw that down grind the back of the tile out so it fits over um, and then we've got a good mounting for our rail and then you just repeat that with these been landscape panels up the pitch of the roof if they were portrait panels you would have hooks along your rails this way and again, the distances on those with these timbers, you'd have one within 300 mil of the edge, and then you'd be working at about 1200 um, spacings. You could, if you want, drop an extra one in here and there on a 600 mil gap, maybe towards where you've got the rails been joined, if you wanted to, it wouldn't hurt. And all the rail manufacturers have different specifications based on the wind zone that you're in for the spacing on your hooks. So you need to make sure you consider that and check your MCS uh, manual to make sure you're following that carefully is what you don't want is these um, wind loads pressing onto your roof causing stress on the timbers because you've not got enough hooks with downward wind force but equally with the wind uplift you want enough hooks in there that's going to hold your rail and panels solidly on the roof um, with the first breeze that comes along and not end up down the street so it's um, making sure you do follow that very carefully but we'll show you those some of those some of those going in in just a few minutes we'll get on with doing that right now and with the hooks on this side to line up with the ones on the other side, they're actually going on the left of the timbers. Um, opposite way around to the other side. I guess it's just the nature of the way they've laid the tiles out. Um, I think they've got a half cut on the other side and they've put that half cut at that end. So it's spun it out the other way. You see that's in that groove now. So that's all nicely screwed down. Um, again, with the calcs on your wind loading, you, sometimes you'll need to use bigger fatter longer screws sometimes you'll need to use three as opposed to two um we can't quite get three in on these it's just outside the the timbers um, but obviously the more fixings the better with this um, but with our particular system here two screws absolutely fine so again you line your hook up sit it on the top of the tile under there um, and then just screw it into the the timber it's as simple as that really uh, you can if you want use a combi driver if you're not happy using impacts Matthew knows just how many dugger duggers to put on these to get them in nice and tight. 
Uh, and then here you've got some adjustment on the Van der Volt ones. Some of the fixing systems, so Fast and Sol, which we've used before, are a fixed clamp, so they're kind of welded here. So there's no movement on that. With Van der Volt, you do get a bit of wiggle. Obviously, there's a bit of extra work going along tightening all these up, but you can set them absolutely square, which is really helpful when you are doing especially your vertical rails from my experience so far. And again, you get these adjustment holes on here. So if you need to swing your hook over to the edge, as we have on this one, you can do that. So once you've got all set out and you're starting to fix your hooks, these Van der Volt ones give you some real flexibility that some of the, the welded brackets don't. Um, so we've used Fast and Sol before and they're actually welded onto this base bracket and there's no movement in it, both um, side to side and also with a little wiggle as well. So these will really help you get things square and straight on the roof and help you keep your distances from the end of those panels. Because as we discussed, the timber spacings on these are 600. But the panels, I think, are 1760. So, by the time you've got your space with your mid clamps, you're still running out a little bit all the way along the array. And these can sometimes help you just by shifting along, as we've done here on this one. So you get a couple of screws in, they go in the back. And then when you tighten this back nut here, you want to set it because these will move up and down. So, you're off the tile underneath. So, any deflection by the wind, you're not actually going to push on that tile and squish it. As you can see, as we move along, we've got that nice gap for any movement on the bracket isn't hitting into the tile which is what you want you want that as close as you can get without being too close that you're crushing the tile underneath if there is any wind uplift downlift whatever you want to call it on your array later on because you don't want these tiles cracking um, under the panels obviously if you need to repair that you've got to take the array off which is not the best uh, so you don't want to be in that position so I might just move it along getting those nice and straight and then when it comes to fasten the rails you also get a bit of adjustment with these as well up and down because um, obviously the timbers on a roof aren't always square straight and true as we all know in most houses you work in very rarely the case these ones actually look pretty decent but just having that little bit of adjustment can really help you out when you come to leveling your rails off later on um, and you can see, I think, I've got a few marks on the roof if we're under there. I'll show you where the edge of our array is. So the end of our array is here at this side. It's about 300 mil past the last hook, which is right. Um, and then all the way along, we're also trying to keep the same on the joins with the panels as well. So you can see here, that's where the panels are actually going to join. And we're equally spaced between these two hooks. So we're trying to match that all the way down to the end. Um, and then we've got the fixing in the right place for the number of hooks for the rail and mounting system but then the clamps in the right place for the man panel manufacturers to hold them down correctly as well and when we get to that stage it'll make sense what I mean I think and, and I'll show you that later on so I don't know that's coming up on camera but I've just marked each side of the hook there and that's where we need to grind out so this tile will sit flush because you can see if we just drop that on the hook there it's all held up which is absolutely no good because weather and insects and anything that likes can get itself in there. So we've grind the back of that out and then drop it down on top of the hook. So we've ground that out now with the Milwaukee M18. That's the rapid stop. These take 115 blades. These are just your stone masonry blades. Um, the Bosch variant will take a 125 blade, which sometimes can grind out a little bit quicker, but these are quite easy. They're soft um, pan tiles. And we're just taking these ribs out, as you can see here on this side. So, uh, just take those out so they sit flat over the hook and it's always best to take too little rather than too much so we start off just taking the least out that i think is going to work we'll drop it on the top see how it looks if we need a bit more out we can always trim a bit more off um but yeah that's how we do that i'll pop it in and show you how it looks so there you can see that's the hook ground in there's a little bit of a gap at the side but nothing too bad space over the top the tile's not sitting on the hook whatsoever and it's sat flush down onto the tiles at the side of it which is what we want no insects no weather getting in there um, you're never going to get super duper accurate with these it's the nature of the beast grinding out you just try your best to get as close as you can obviously the main aim is that you're not going to crack any of these tiles once the system's on the top of all of this um, but again uh, there's not really going to be any pressure on this tile up here to then push down on the hooks and the main aim is the gap under here for the deflection that I spoke about before but yeah that's a nice seal on that one i'll show you a few more as i work my way along the roof and see how we get on at the end of this row and that's one row done it took about i don't know 10 15 minutes to just grind the lot out um 12 of them all along and they're all sat down nice nice gaps around the um, hooks and none of the tiles are lifted they're not getting things out of the way they're not touching um the tiles above 
there's just enough of a gap there as you can see as we move along um, and that's that one row done just going to close up these little bits of the roof we've had to open to lift the tiles above and then we're going to replicate that another three times so our vertical rails again we've got a row of hooks going on the middle and a row towards the top i think we've got two tiles gap for the next one and then three tiles gap for the top one and then that's this side all hooked ready for rail as well okay just spraying on some biocide um, this is just to try and kill off the the moss and algae um, depending on which version you get you mix it up in a different ratio this is one to four for stuff that's a little bit worse you can dilute it down one to nine if your moss and mildew or whatever else isn't quite so bad as we faced here but it made sense just because we had so much moss and algae on this roof we scraped it all off brushed it away um, there's some loose bits still left on here that need brushing off we sprayed the other side yesterday we're going to put some panels down on there this afternoon this side we're spraying today we'll let it dry in overnight um, and it'll just further kill off anything else that's under there the microbes or whatever's in there will, it'll get stuck in and then the bits that are left out on sure and the customer can't quite as easily get to now we've well we're going to be putting solar panels on and um, we can then uh, hopefully clean it up a little bit for them while we're doing this work and um, get it back to something like reasonable and we don't want any moss and stuff falling down into the bird garden array at the top either so it makes sense to just give it a quick rinse out so that's by side you can get it for roofs you can get it for stone work patios wood just make sure you get the right one for your intended use and you read the instructions for the mix you need and get a mask on wear some gloves get your safety glasses on i don't know if it's especially dangerous i didn't read the warning but sticking a bit of epa on to make sure you're not getting it in your you gobble your eyes is a good move in my opinion. Um, we'll move on with the install. We've leveled up on this side. You see the string lines are all done. The um, rails are all touching. We've been along with a full rail length all the way just to see if there are any gaps. There was in places, so a little one might have just dropped down a couple of mil or so, and that'll be really noticeable. So it's um, a case of trying to get this as straight and as flat as possible. With the panels being in landscape, the roof being quite low down, you don't get away with as much as you could if you were on top of the main house roof over there in the distance, for example. So we're just giving our best effort to get things set out nicely so it looks like a nice flat black surface when we're all done. Let's see how it comes together. Got a couple of panels down already. We've been kept off the roof a bit this morning because it's been raining. You can see it's still a little bit wet up there. It's a little bit slippy, so we're being careful as we go. But I just wanted to talk about how we actually mount these panels. So you'll see here we've got clamps on the bottom, clamp in the middle clamp at the top so these are your end clamps they're a little bit different these ones so they have a profile like that and um, basically you kind of twist it in to the rail so you pop it in there and twist it clockwise and then you squish that down and lock it in on those side bitey bits that you can see and then you screw this down and it locks it onto the panel to form a nice solid um, fixing the mid clamps are just the same apart from there's a space each side for the panels to lock under the wings on the top and it holds both down together so under one rail you've got three hooks the three fixing points so per panel there is four fixings um, and yeah they hold them down very solidly these obviously are out in the elements exposed to quite a lot of wind both putting pressure on the array and lifting it and it needs to be rock solid so we've got the eight panels to get on this side now the sun's come out for us which is going to help with drying out perhaps not so much on this side because it's tracking that way this is an east facing roof but we're going to do our best to get these eight panels down um, get the rails cut and trimmed i'll show you some of that and then the bed guard all the way around the only things you really need to watch as you go in is that you keep your spacing consistent between the rows columns because there's no clamps and such between them you are kind of eyeing it in making sure you keep it nice and that your levels stay consistent so the best will in the world even using the string lines as we have sometimes the rails drop out of line um, or the string line sagged or we've just not set it correctly sometimes that can happen um, and even the panels are not always true and uniform and square and straight so they may need some tweaking and you can do that as you go along if you keep your eye on it the clamps again we've set in the right position so we've got those for the wind load rating we need of this array the jinko panels can be mounted on the corners they can be mounted on the short side they can be mounted on the long side you can mount them in a configuration of any of those things together whichever you choose affects the wind rating i think it's pa that the system can take um, if you want to go towards the maximum of that then you need to be a divided by five plus or minus five percent on the long side mounting which is roughly 330 mil to 370 mil which these are so we're at the 
upper limit of what this system can take by the way we're putting it down on these rails but we'll move on with that now and um, we'll get on with it i'll show you when we've got the rest of the panels down and then we'll trim off the rail put the end caps on and get some bird guard around catch up with you in a little while when we've done some work okay so i thought we'd have a look at fitting an optimizer on a panel so again these are the tiger tiger optimizers they just push on the frame so they clamp onto the panel frame itself and they sit flush on the panel that's so it can monitor its temperature as well as monitoring all of the um, voltages and currents that are going on within the panel itself and these give you great flexibility because the tiger tiger optimizers work with most all panels i think um, whereas the solar edge ones are just solar edge specific so far as i know uh, you can get the tiger tiger um, app and wi-fi dongly thing to connect into it to see down to a panel level how the system is performing um, and it gives you more data than you would just get from the inverter should you wish to do that see this little qr code on the back there which kind of maps where the panel is as well so if there is a problem with it you can find out i'll just plug those in to show you where they all go we do actually fasten these down on the roof but gives you a visual idea but you put your panel wires into the optimizer so your two wires coming off the back of the panel go into these short wires on the optimizer then you have the longer wires which connect into your array and these optimizers are thousand volt rated um, for a whole string voltage you can have 80 volts for the panel itself 15 amps 700 watts so these work very well with these jinko panels which if we look here are 430 watts and 32.58 volts when the system's under operation so vmp and our current is 13.2 amps a little bit higher on the open circuit ones that's essentially when the system's off load and there's just light hitting the panel um so these are the ones we're looking at works really well with the tiger tiger optimizers these are the ts4 a zeros hope that was interesting and that's us on and down you can see there's 12 panels now all on this side got a 400 mil of space in at the sides top and bottom so a tile and a half there this is nice and flat all the way along which is what we want there's no up and down in the uh, panels they're looking square and true go and have a look from ground level and double check that they are all looking nice our clamps are in the right place um, and yeah it doesn't take too long once you start laying the panels down it's a bit faster if you've taken your time with the hooks and the rail getting them square and straight matt is going to run along now and trim all these rails off that need it on the bottom at this side get the end caps on we've left the two panels off at that corner at the other side so you can jump up run along the ridge and trim these at this side end clamps and then get the bird guard in along the ridge we'll drop the last two panels on and then bird guard up the rest hopefully we can get that done today i'm going to jump inside to the inverter now and have a test of these make sure they're performing as they should be and i'll show you some of that when i jump down there in just a minute Okay, you can see we've now got our uh, solar connectors disconnected from the inverter. Got our DC isolators in the off position, so there is no voltage on the end of these at present. Was able to disconnect them out of the bottom of the inverter super duper easy using my little removal tool in the LK kit. We flagged these up as pos and neg with these little um, tags that attach onto the DC cable. You can label these as well as string one and string two with the appropriate voltages as well, which we'll do at the end. But for the minute, you can see we've got the PV check over here. And this is going to help us make sure that all of our commissioning and testing is done correctly. So we can start off by safely inserting these MC4 solar connectors into our string. You can see the DC isolators are off, so I'm able to do that perfectly safely. Apologise about the lighting, but it's the sun shining right in the garage door, which is a bit frustrating. I'll try and get you in some better light. You can see there we've got zero volts. If I now move the DC isolator for the west string into the on position, you should be able to see we've got voltage there now. So around 450 volts. We should really be around 460 or so. However, as you saw, the west array is now in the shade. It's two o'clock in the afternoon-ish and there's no sun hitting that array. So the voltage will be a little bit lower. Um, you need to remember that the standard test conditions for the outputs um, are based on certain criteria so it's, you're going to get some variation on that but this is in the right ballpark so we're happy with that now one of the things we can do with the pv check is we can use our iridians meter that transmits wirelessly with this um, to send real-time iridians off that west face back to the test instrument which we can look at the panel data as well in the instrument and it will tell us how the system's performing based upon all of that so i'll get set up for that now and um, run through it super duper quick in just a minute. 
So we're going to have a look at our efficiency test now. You can see I've got the Solar O2 with the um, receiver transmitter. So this is the HT304N. This takes in the Iridian's value, passes that over to the Solar O2, and that will wirelessly transmit that data back to the PV check. So you can see at the minute it's measuring no Iridians because we're inside. I'm going to give this to Matthew, who's going to take it up onto the roof in just a second. I need to start the test first. We should have to go for a little wait period while everything pairs up. But just to show you on there, we're measuring voltage, current. Um, we've got the clamp around the positive leg on our string. Obviously, it's not connected into the inverter at present. We're just doing this as a little experiment. And you can see here it's fluctuating some readings. So if I press start on the test, it says it's waiting for the receiver. The receiver puts a whole time frame on, and that's just while it's connecting itself up with the PV check. So once that countdown's finished, you can see it's on 35 at the minute, so it's going to run through. It will then start transmitting data back to the PV check. You can take this up onto your array. At that stage, you need to stay within a close proximity to it while it gets going that, um, with that. And then it will send that data back to the PV check. So it's nearly finished that little countdown. Um, as soon as it does, we'll jump it up onto the roof. Okay, now you can see it's saying recording running. So we're paired now. Matthew should be able to jump up onto the roof first and put that down. You can see the sun's actually dropped right behind the clouds. There's actually, you know, it's pretty got pretty dark all of a sudden, which is typical, isn't it? Um, but as he's running up there onto the roof, that Solar O2 is gonna collect the data. It's not actually transmitting it live with the PV check. It's storing it within itself. And then when it comes back and we stop that test, if you just give it 30 seconds, Matthew, on the roof face, then bring it back down and we can pop it over and see how it's performed. And obviously we've set that to tie in um, with our panels as well. So you can make sure you select those within the, the settings and it will compare all of that to what's actually anticipated as a result. If you want to see a full video of this, I'm not gonna tag it in in detail on this one. Um, I think it was three or four videos ago, I did, a, I did a full solar PV array test, which covers the PV check in great detail. Um, at the minute, I have to use that in combination with the ISA test, but the PV check Pro, which is just fresh out after Solar Storage and Live last year, has the functions of both those two built into one product. So that's well worth checking out. It can do your fault finding if you've got a break in one of the strings somewhere, and it can do all of the performance checks as well to ensure that your system's performing correctly. So we're gonna repeat that on both strings. We're gonna do all of our IR testing as well and make sure we're all safe and compliant. Okay, we've brought the Solar O2 back down to the PV check. If we press to stop that test now, stop recording, we hit enter. It'll do an analysis of that, download it into the test instrument, and you can review it later on on the software as well. So that's really, really useful. So it's uh, analysing the data itself now. It's looked at the um, watts per metre, the temperature, the elevation of the roof as well, so you get a, an angle and pitch from the Solar O2. It'll actually do that. I think I can show you... Uh, if we just get it set and change the function, you can see it'll fluctuate the angle and pitch that it's laid down on our roof. So it's measuring all of those things in itself, it ties up really well with the PV check. If we go back into the main menu, uh, we'll exit without saving because we're going to run through all these tests once we've actually finished. We still need to get some stuff off the scaffold. I was just demonstrating for you guys. You can do the full IV test. So you can see I've got it set here for Trina 415 panels. We need to change that to the Jinko 430s. You can save your modules in the test set so you can recall them and it populates with all the data of that panel into itself so it knows what panels it's looking at. You then just need to tell it how many panels there are. And when you run through this, doing your insulation resistance, your pet protective earth bonding and the performance test, it does it all in the instrument linked with this remote and we'll give you uh, a yes or no in terms of performance and safety, which is what you want. When we're talking about all of the DC isolators and stuff and burnt out connectors and things, the importance of doing the test at the initial install and then at the regular maintenance intervals cannot be understated because these things do pull out problems. So yeah, TIS PV Check Pro, if you're looking now, would be my recommendation. I'll drop a link in the description alongside the video. So they can see the roof all buttoned up. It's a little bit um, damp this morning. So the panels have got a bit of dew on there, but they are um, performing as expected. It's a very dull morning today, so we've not got any sunshine whatsoever. You can see so over in the distance there, right behind the clouds. 
it's not really outputting a great deal. I think we've got 500 watts between the two arrays on the east and west face. It's going to be interesting as the seasons move along to see what this actually chucks out. If you can see up there, but we've got the bird guard in place. So that's under there. I'll take you up on the scaffold and have a look through as well. But yeah, we're happy with that. I'll um, get you a bit of footage around the other side as well so we can see what that looks like and we will go from there. So as you can see inside, we're in and generating. Um, we're currently getting about 500 watts, as I said, which isn't a great amount, but it is raining and very dull. So we're not going to get much more than that. Might have been along and pop some more of these um, DC voltage warning labels up everywhere. We've got branded up on all the products with our little logos there, which I think look really good. These are kind of a raised profile hardware in sticker. It's just an easy point of reference for somebody to see who did it, website address, and that we are putting stuff on socials so we're sharing what we're up to nothing to hide here and the same on the consumer unit and the document holder now this has all of the manufacturers instructions for every product we've used the data sheets and then in the back we've got the schematics we've got the electrical installation certificate we have got our mcs certificate and insurance we've got our um, electrical installation certificate building regs notice let me just the address i won't lift them out because they've got customer details on i might have to blur that last section out um but yeah all there ready to hand and obviously these are all delivered electronically as well but things go missing people move out and these paper trails may stay longer than the electronic ones so it's always worthwhile popping those in we have stuck an earth rod just outside here i'll spin you around you can see there's a little earth pit out here now so that's rodded for reference down here at the garage and that was so we could steal the two cars on this cable coming in so this had a four car um 10 mil feed coming down here so it's what we've done is paralleled up those conductors so we've got a nice big feed I was concerned a little bit about the one percent volt drop with the pv generation so in doing that it gave us a bit more capacity on the cabling so obviously we've got 20 mil conductors on the line and neutral which really helps uh, we're well within tolerance at that level which is fantastic but obviously that left us without an earth down here other than on the armor ends of that cable so we popped a little rod in outside and now um, the armors are still tied into that rod so they're still taking that back to the house and then the rod is connected in in parallel with the house as well for the island in mode and there is also I can't show you because the customer's house is there with all their stuff, but there's a hot tub as well, and it has an earth rod tied to the install too. So there's a couple of earth rods on there to help us with the backup side on the PME and also for our island in mode earth connection. It's running parallel with the existing earth. You've got to be really careful if you are switching out your earthing systems when you go into island mode that you're also taking into account the bonds switching over as well. It can get pretty complicated, and on the TNTS, you're quite okay to parallel up those if you wish, as long as you've got a stable and reliable earth on your install via the rods for when you are in island in mode, it doesn't matter so much if you're tied in with the DNO side of things as well. So it's interesting after sharing content on these DC isolators through the course of this last week, so we're in the second week back after Christmas, I think. Um, loads of smaller installers getting in touch saying they feel like they're not really being listened to and there is kind of too much value given to some of these big national companies that tend to use cheaper labour and removing electrical connections could be argued is in their favour and those from the training space as well who obviously want to have a potential pool of more people coming on their courses and it seems like rather than listen to the people out doing this stuff um, they're paying attention to those who maybe have a vested interest in getting rid of stuff like this. And we see the poor quality with solar PV installs day to day. You just have to look on social media to see hooks that have been installed incorrectly, rear systems that are loose and wobbling around. There are issues with the inverter locations and how they are mounted, the ventilation around them and such. And even down to the basics such as paperwork, MCS and G99. So all of these things have been done incorrectly at large scale on a national scale so are we saying that we should remove hooks from pv systems because they're the problem should we remove in mcs and paperwork because that's a problem should we remove in inverters because they set on fire and they're a problem or should we do the thing that's really necessary and ensure gatekeeping on those who are installing this stuff is correct and that those doing it are actually properly qualified electricians and my answer to that question and hopefully the rest of industry will eventually come to the same conclusion as myself and some of the smaller installers out there who sometimes don't have the voice to be listened to.
So you can see down here at the garage, we are using a hybrid inverter. Now that is never to couple DC batteries. We're not gonna be doing that unless things change in terms of the gateway and AIO and how it can integrate with DC coupled batteries. You never know the speed the industry's moving. Maybe that becomes something that can be done. The issue is the batteries can kind of fight against each other, charging each other up, all of that good stuff. Um, in this application, we just wanted an EPS port basically to power these garage circuits. Um, we could have tapped into the main switch down here, made this a sub main and tied the PV into it, but this just seemed a nicer solution. So we've got the garage circuits running off the EPS port in the inverter. Obviously there's no DC coupled batteries, so they're not gonna ever run just through those batteries in that application. But if the power is to cut, the AC is still fed down to this inverter via the all-in-one and gateway, they'll remain energized. And we thought it was a nice solution. There's very negligible load down here. You're talking local lighting and sockets for charging battery drills, rarely used. Obviously there will impact on the generation that the all-in-one and gateway can see down at the house because that will have been subtracted down at this end if there is some power consumption. However, it's all metered and measured here anyway. So for us, it was a good workaround to avoid dragging a 30 or 40 meter steel wire armor cable down the garden, digging it up, all the extra expense for the customer in and around that. This seemed like the most cost-effective and sensible solution, but let me know in the comments what you think to that and if you'd have done it differently. We're always interested to see what other installers' views are in and around such things, so please do let me know. So here we've got the all-in-one down at the house, and as always, we've got the rotary isolated to the side there from M2. As you can see, we've got the work mats out, tough built bag, all ready to go. And with this one, we've used some of the D-line trunking, just nice to get the cable across the top of that skirting board there. There was no access under the floor or the ceilings with this one. It's the neatest way of getting back to the main service area. It's got the lights on the front there to indicate direction of travel of the energy, the wireless antenna up on the top, and the wiring center in the side, which is where you make your electrical and data connections, the DC MCB, and the on off button it's the aerial just on the top there so we're getting a good signal down to the aio over at the gateway you can see we've got our meters reading they're giving off the correct values and that ties in with the app we've got our main grid switch where the power comes in from the grid and back to it when you're exporting the bypass switch should it be needed we still need to put the cover on that so it can't be accidentally switched on and the load side of things then they've got your pv and aio inputs so the gateway is really the place everything connects together and brings the whole system into one, both whilst connected to the grid and if you ever end up in island mode. And the gateway again has the same lights on the front, so it's the same style across the whole range of Q-Energy products. Gives you a rough indication of what's going on in the system and if there are any fault states. In this case, you can see everything is nice and green and we are good to go. The customer's consumer unit could definitely do with upgrading. The electrician who recommended us for this job is now primed to replace it. It's been in since the house was built in around 2003 and it is a little bit congested in there. We've removed the circuit feeding down to the garage to now cover off our PV generation circuit as discussed already. However, this is very much due a bit of an upgrade. So over to you, Tom, with that one. And thank you very much for putting our details over on this job. We also installed a My Energy Eddy on this one and that's to use any excess solar to also heat the hot water tank that's on this installation. So that monitors for an export. If it sees it, it will use that energy to power the immersion element to then heat the hot water in the tank. You can set that to a schedule as well if you wish as normal, and you can also override and boost should the gas go down on this installation. So it gives you really good flexibility. And of course, if the export payments reach a level where it's not financially viable to run this, you can just leave it switched off as per normal. So I hope you've enjoyed taking a look through this solar PV system behind me here. We've really enjoyed doing it. Massive thanks to our customers, as always, for giving us the opportunity to do so. And if you would like a proposal or quotation for a solar PV battery storage or EV charge point and wider electrical work beyond that, please do get in touch. Contact details in the description below. And as I said at the start of the video, if you're enjoying the content, don't forget to subscribe, give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. And I'm here for the comments, tips, tricks, or questions about what we've done get them in below and I'll do my best to try and answer everybody. There is a gentleman called Ryan Dempsey who is doing a challenge that I'm going to link in the description as well. It's to raise some much needed funds that go towards supporting mental health. Link below, please do go and check that out. And if you can offer Ryan a bit of support along with the link for the Just Giving that will be in the description. And good luck in the challenge. I really hope you pull it off and I'm sure other people will join me in donating some money to an excellent cause. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you on the next one.